Hello, this is Dean Radin. My talk today is Psychic Phenomena and Quantum Mechanics. So I'm going to talk about three questions, basically. Does mind interact with matter? Uh, psychic phenomena, otherwise known as psi, and quantum mechanics have certain similarities. Are these coincidences or not? And also a little bit about why does any of this work? So the first question, does mind interact with matter? Well, this has been studied extensively for many years now, well over 50 years. Uh, and the, the question initially came down to uh, the use of very sensitive systems, like probabilistic systems, originally the tossing of dice. And then in more recent times, meaning last 40 years or so, uh, the use of electronic random number generators. So this version here is an, is, was used at the Princeton Engineering Anomalies Research Lab for many years. Uh, today, you can buy essentially the same thing in a little memory stick. All it does is produce random bits. So in a typical experiment at Princeton, they would do hundreds of thousands of trials involving many people who would be asked to mentally influence the random numbers coming out so that it would produce more ones and more zeros. And so ever, over many, many repeated trials, you can see that cumulatively that's what happened. And then they would be asked to produce uh, fewer then, then a fewer number of ones or more number of zeros, and they would get that. And then under a baseline condition, it would just meander around chance. So the statistics in these experiments were very clear that to a very small extent, people can use their mind, their intention to manipulate the probabilities of events. So in 1989, I was at Princeton with my um, colleague, Roger Nelson. We did an analysis of more than 800 experiments of this type. And we found unequivocal effects, positive effects in experimental conditions and chance results in control conditions. This means that when you look across the board at many different uh, laboratories and uh, investigators, that you see these same effects again and again. So this pretty much establishes that mind can influence matter at least at a probabilistic scale. So since then, I've done many other kinds of experiments looking at other targets. So one target was water. You probably are all familiar with uh, Dr. Emoto's claim that uh, if you think beautiful thoughts and then you create a frozen water crystal, that it will be nice looking. And if you think bad thoughts, you either don't get any crystal at all or it just doesn't look very good. So the way he did this was you would take a Petri dish, put in a drop of water, and then put that into a freezer to create crystals. Uh, and typically the, the, they were in here, but there's also a walk-in freezer. You go in the walk-in freezer and there's a big microscope and the microscope then looks at, at in detail at the top, this very tip top here of the frozen water crystal in each Petri dish. And so it's very tiny, these little crystals. And when you take a picture of it, it looks like something like this. And it only, this crystal only occurs at the very tip top of the water drop. So we did an experiment. So uh, Dr. Emoto and a group of people in Tok Tokyo sent their beautiful thoughts to our laboratory in California to two bottles of Fiji brand commercial water, which they then attempted to treat. We also set aside two additional bottles, which we didn't tell them about, which we'd use as controls. So here's a picture of Dr. Emoto in front of the audience up on the screen there. These are the two bottles that they were asked to send their thoughts to. And up here is a prayer of gratitude for the water. So it, uh, between Tokyo and our laboratory is something like six or 7,000 miles. So that's the distance that they were doing this experiment. Uh, this, this is the prayer of gratitude. And this is actually, this picture is the inside of our laboratory. So we sent them four bottles and we just labeled them ABCD. Two of them were the ones they treated and two were the controls and we didn't tell them which was which. We asked them to take uh, pictures of crystals from, from each of the four uh, sources. Uh, and of course they didn't know which was which. So it said, to send us all of the pictures. So some of the pictures look like that. Some of the pictures look like this. These are quite different than what you see in Dr. Emoto's books, but this is what the crystals actually look like. So the bottom line was this. We, uh, we, we've got all of the water that was treated and all the crystals, all of the controls, 
And, and in each case, we asked a uh, hundred judges to look at each crystal without knowing the condition and to assess how beautiful it was. So this, this is more or less trying to replicate what Dr. Emoto claimed about the beauty of the crystal. And there is a significant difference between the treated and the control. The treated were slightly more beautiful, but as you can see, the range is much, much greater than the way that he would typically portray the results. He was selecting the best looking crystals and the worst looking crystals. That's okay for artistic purposes, but not if you're doing an experiment. Nevertheless, it still went in the direction that he claimed. So more recently, we've done an experiment where we're testing what happens to water during energy medicine healing periods. So here's a healer. She wears this around her neck on a, uh, on a lanyard. And also the, the client wears a similar kind of aliquot around her neck too. So the healing takes place. Uh, we use distilled water in this case. So there's a pretest of the spectral composition of the water. And then there's the healing session, which takes 30 minutes, and then a post-test. Uh, what we used in this is a fancy spectrometer called attenuated total reflection Fourier transform infrared spectrometer, which looks like this. Uh, here is a little portal where you can put in liquid nitrogen. And the reason is that these spectrometers are so sensitive that you have to cool the, uh, the camera down to liquid nitrogen level in order to get extreme sensitivity. And what we're looking at here, this is the way it works. Uh, you have a sample of water, and then you have a, a special kind of crystal. You send an infrared beam through it, and it bounce, goes through the water a little bit, bounces down through the crystal, goes back and forth, in our case, 20 times, and then goes to the detector. What we're able to see when you do this is that there are certain molecular frequencies within the water that uh, give you a different spectrum across the board. So the, each of these spectrums is telling us something about the composition of the water and also the molecular movements. So you can think of this in terms of resonance that when you send infrared energy into water or any substance, uh, there will be some resonances with the molecular frequencies different than others. And that's why you end up with a, with a graph that looks like this. And the main way that the mo molecules, the hydrogen oxygen molecules can change is through these six ways. So they can stretch, they can bend, they can do these six kinds of movements. And you can tell based on what the spectrum looks like. So this is the absorption spectrum that we ended up with. Uh, it's a very significant difference at this point. And this is an important point because it's a place where infrared energy is absorbed the most within, uh, within water. And so this is the red curve is testing beforehand and the blue curve is testing afterwards. And it shows that there's a significant change in, in this case, in the stretching bonds of hydrogen and oxygen in the water. So it's this, this bond, the hydrogen oxygen bond, and it's being stretched. So we don't know exactly how that happens, but that is what happened uh, during these energy medicine sessions. So the next thing we looked at was, can we mentally influence food? Well, this comes about by things like the practice of the Eucharist and Catholicism, where through prayer and intention, a little wafer turns into something quite different. At least that's the point of the, of the ceremony. So we didn't want to use a, a wafer. We used these little pastilles of chocolate. And we used a classic double-blind randomized placebo-controlled design to see if intention could change how people responded to the chocolate. So we had a Buddhist monk use their intention and a Mongolian shaman. And here's the, the shaman with these little chocolate pieces. So they are both putting intention of this into the, into the chocolate, enhanced sense of energy, vigor, and well-being. And the way to measure at this then was we ended up with blessed chocolate and we recruited people for that part of the experiment and controlled chocolate. And of course, the people that didn't know which kind of chocolate they, they were dealing with and the people who gave them didn't know either. So it was double blind in that sense. So the measurement was mood. So the, the intention imprinted in the chocolate was about mood, changes in mood. So we asked them to record their mood using a standardized scale every day over the course of a week. In the three middle days of the week, they would eat the chocolate at 10 a.m. and 3 p.m. In the evening of every day, they record their mood. So this is the result that we got. 
here's the seven days, the three days of eating chocolate, three, four, and five. We predicted that if there was going to be an effect, it would show up probably most likely on the third day of eating chocolate, which is this day here. These are 95% error bars. You can see the plants and that people uh, getting the treated chocolate, which is the, the, this one. This is the treated chocolate, this is the control. Uh, this is in terms of mood disturbance. So there's more mood disturbance or poorer mood for people getting the control chocolate and better mood in people getting the treated chocolate. So that's what we had predicted and that's what we got significantly. So intention significantly improved the mood altering properties of chocolate. Then we decided, uh, can we do the same thing with tea? And so this I did with a colleague in Taiwan, created a big batch of oolong tea, separated it into two batches as three Buddhist monks at a temple in Taiwan to do a similar kind of treatment or blessing of one of batches, uh, put them in, put the tea in little bottles and then recruited a hundred people in each case and in this case, it's change in mood. So up means better. So the blessed chocolate under, under, by the end of the experiment, this is the end of the drinking period, the third day, a significantly improved mood in people getting the blessed uh, tea than getting the control tea. So in this case, intention significantly improved the mood altering properties of tea. Then we decided to do a similar thing only without a subjective measure, but use an objective measure, in this case, plant growth. We used a little plant called Arabidopsis thaliana. It's a plant used a lot in plant physiology studies. Uh, the full genome is understood. There's a lot known about this particular plant. Uh, so here's the team in Taiwan. These are the three Buddhist monks, members of the temple. Uh, we had control bottles of water. We had the same source of water, which was then blessed by these monks. This is my colleague, uh, Yongyong Xia in Taiwan. And this is what we're interested in, the growth of these little seeds. So we take the Arabidopsis seeds, uh, they are sterilized, they're put into mediums, growth mediums, and they either are getting medium A or medium B. It's there people dealing with the, the growing and the hydration had no idea which was treated and controlled, but that's what the A and B was about. And uh, then they would measure various measures uh, on these little plants. So the measure of interest is called the hypocotyl, which is the, uh, the, from the top of the roots to the bottom of the first leaves. That's this distance. And a healthy plant has a short and fat hypocotyl. It means that the seed was able to save most of its energy. And so it's still, it's, it's still there. It's still a lot of energy left in order for it to poke up and start growing as it sees the sun. If you had planted the seed upside down or too deep or whatever, uh, the hypocotyl would become rather long and stringy and that's not a very uh, healthy plant then. So this is the result. The, the distance, the, the short fat hypocotyl was indeed in the treated condition. Again, 95% error bars, whopping difference statistically. In terms of absolute difference, it was only a matter of a couple of millimeters, but it was consistent enough that you're able to see, in this case, a probability of 10 to the minus 14th that the control and treated hypocotyls were actually different. So intentionally significantly improved the growth of seeds by blessing water that was used to grow some of the seeds. We just finished another experiment, again, using blessed water, but to see if it could influence the growth of stem cells. Same group of people, same design, different target stem cells. So th this is interesting because while the other experiments were always were done in Taiwan, this case, in order to do the measurements of the stem cells, we had to fly the water that was treated, the control and the treated water from Taiwan to the University of Tennessee, which is where the rest of the experiment was conducted. So the source of the stem cells is dental pulp. You take a, take a tooth out of a person, uh, extract the pulp, you can create stem cells out of that, and you put it into a medium, some of which was using control water to grow the, the stem cells and other using blessed water. And this doesn't look quite as dramatic as, uh, as what we saw in the plants, but nevertheless, 
If, if you look at uh, by day six and by day, day eight on these experiments, again, 95% confidence intervals, it is in fact a statistically significant difference. And this is in terms of the proliferation. It's the, the amount of growth of the stem cells. So in this case, we found intention significantly improved the growth of stem cells receiving blessed water versus control water. And of course, the nice thing about stem cells is that they, they can turn into all kinds of other bodily cells and it's possible but uh, difficult to maintain the stemness of these cells because these cells are adult stem cells. Uh, they work perfectly fine, but they don't remain as pluripotent for very long. So what we find in our, our experiment is that through intention alone, that the stem cells actually were able to sustain their stem properties. So when you look at the literature, you can find everything from photons up to human behavior as targets for mind-matter interaction. And so we can answer the question, does mind interact with matter? The answer is yes, it does in many different scales. The effects are small in magnitude, it takes lots of repeated trials in order to gain confidence that something's going on. But in almost every target that's ever been used in these cases where you have some control comparison and a targeted comparison, you see both subjective changes in people and objective changes in measurements. So it does, mind interacts with matter. Now, is there a relationship between various kinds of psychic phenomena and quantum mechanics? Is there a, a coincidence going on here or is there something meaningful? So here's the idea. And quantum mechanics has the property of non-locality. That means that there are connections that transcend space and time. The other strange property is in quantum mechanics that the act of observing a system changes the behavior of the system. Neither of these are, do you see in classical mechanics. In psychic phenomena it is also non-local. You see connections that transcend space and time. We also see effects that are involving the observer as we saw in previous experiments that I talked about. So these, both of these properties are considered very strange and they both show up in these two domains. So is this chance? or coincidence? Well, it may not be because a couple of years ago in New Scientist, there was this article by um, Lucien Hardy, who's a well-known physicist at the Perimeter Institute in Canada, who said that a classic quantum test could reveal the limits of the human mind. He proposed a test that uh, a Bell test, meaning looking at entanglement, using something unprecedented human consciousness, if such an experiment showed deviations from quantum mechanics, it could provide the first hints of their minds are potentially immaterial. So this idea has been around in physics for quite a while. To date, nobody has tested it, at least not in the way that we've tested it. So it's well recognized that this is a viable thing to test. And if it worked, that would be quite amazing. And when you look back at the founders of quantum mechanics, including Max Planck, who came up with the idea of the quantum, he was an idealist. He, his metaphysical idea or his, his uh, philosophical assumptions about reality as a consciousness is fundamental. And in fact, many of the founders of quantum mechanics, including Schrodinger, said things like consciousness is absolutely fundamental. You can't get behind it. Uh, here you have Arthur Eddington, the substrate, substratum of everything is of mental character. You find this among most of the founders of quantum mechanics. They're all idealists. You find it up to the present day. Uh, Roger Penrose recently got the Nobel Prize as well, as did Wigner. Uh, this idea runs through the founding of quantum mechanics. Most physicists today are not idealists. They're materialists. And the, the philosophies are, are, are mirror images of each other, which I'll get to later. And it leads to very different assumptions about what's going on in physics. So what we did to test this general idea was to use a double slit optical system. It's a very, very simple optical setup, and it's an easy way to demonstrate something about the nature of mind-matter interaction at this scale. So this is all you need, a, a laser, a, a filter to cut down the intensity, a double slit, and then some kind of a camera or a screen to look at the interference pattern. So that's what we used. We just added a new element of an observer who typically was a meditator who was asked to imagine that they could mentally with their mind's eye, see the, what the behavior of the photons as they went through this double slit. 
And so in this experiment, if you know where the photons are going, you won't get an interference pattern. The act of observation will cause this system to so-called collapse the wave function, and you'll end up with a particulate pattern. So as illustrated by this cartoon, if you're not looking, you don't know where the photons are going, you end up with interference. The moment you look or measure or know, you end up with a particulate pattern. So this, this illustrates in a cartoon way the, the nature of observation. And in this case, for our experiment, is purely mental observation. You're not looking at anything, only with your mind's eye. So that's what the, the system looks like. This is the interference pattern you would get. And if you plot the intensity, it looks like this. So we compare the interference shape during mental observation versus no observation in 30 second periods. You observe mentally for 30 seconds and then you withdraw your attention for 30 seconds plus or minus five. And you repeat this many times. So the measurement of interest is what is happening in the interference pattern as a differential measure between observe and rest. So here's just one example of, four, of 50 planned sessions in this kind of experiment. Uh, you can see then that this is the control. This is the, when observing, 95% confidence intervals, this is a very strong difference. Again, magnitude wise, it's pretty small, but it's statistically speaking, we have high confidence that this is a real effect. So we published this in 2012 and since then, uh, we published a whole bunch of uh, repeated studies. This is the 2012 one, the most recent ones this year, 2021. Uh, they're all published in physics journals. Uh, interestingly, because this is a known issue in physics, it, it's acceptable in physics journals. It would actually be more difficult to publish this in a psychology journal because psychologists don't know much about quantum mechanics or even why this is an interesting experiment to run. More recently, we just finished, we haven't published this yet, an experiment involving entangled photons. And this is a little bit closer to what the, the physicist was mentioning in New Scientist. It's about testing the non-local properties of quantum mechanics. So that's what entangled photons are all about. So that's what it looks like. And, and the way it works, it, it just in a block, uh, a block diagram is this, that inside this box, you have a laser, uh, intense blue laser, which bounces off a mirror, bounces off another mirror, goes through a crystal, and through this process called spontaneous parametric down conversion, splits it into two photons. A blue photon becomes a red photon, and the photons that are scattered in these two directions are entangled by, by design. So they're sent through different polarizers. The polarizers are sent into a coincidence counting box. And so the polarizers do this. You could have the polarizers set to be the same, so that all of the light coming through one, they sh all should be coming through the other one too, because they're entangled. They're basically the same properties. Uh, so you should be 100% coincidence. If you do it crosswise, you should get zero coincidence. And then there's a whole bunch of other versions. You end up with 16 different ways that you can arrange the polarizers to look at different levels of coincidence. So when you do this, here's the 16 different measurements. Uh, in this case, you're taking, you're integrating photons over two seconds, 2,000 milliseconds, and getting different counts, as you see. You take these counts and you apply it through a method that was developed by uh, Clauser, Horn, Shimoni, and Holt. It's very complicated, but actually it's, it's straightforward algebra. It's a way of combining the, the, the different uh, 16 counts in the various ways to come up with a single number. And so here, as you can see, the number is 2.7. So I'll explain this in a minute, but this is a way of saying, are these photons really entangled or not? Well, 2.7 tells us that they are, and not only are they, but they are 54 standard errors above classical photons. So let me describe a little bit what's going on here. Uh, so these are the fiber optics coming from the optical system into the coincidence detector. And this is, this is me and Arno Delorme, one of my colleagues who is working on the system. And that's, that's where the, the fiber optics come into the device. So what you see on this thing are numbers. It's a number, this is the degree of correlation strength, it's the degree of uh, to which the photon pairs are entangled. And so the entanglement, as you see, as you go from one measurement to the next, it, there's fluctuations in this measurement. And this, this is because 
entanglement is not all or nothing thing. It is degrees of entanglement. So the, the, the tasks are uh, to look at this, this graph, which is linked in real time to the entanglement strength and simply will it to go up or to relax and withdraw your attention. So the, the idea of this is that this correlation strength uh, is developed in a way of looking at the degree to which if you change one of the, the polarizers, the, the other one in principle, if it was classical photon, it wouldn't know that this one changed. Like this one is here and this one's changing. It doesn't know what's happening there. But if it's entangled, it does know because if this one turns this way, the photons will behave as though they got turned actually in the other direction. So there's a stronger correlation between entangled photons than there are in classical photons. Classical photons, this one doesn't know what that one's doing. In entangled photons, they do know, that's the difference. So the number two is the, uh, the threshold where classical photons turn into quantum photons. So between two and two square roots of two, approximately 2.8, that range is where you know when you do these mathematics, this is stronger than classical. This is now entangled photons. So in the experiment then, since we have people concentrate and relax, the instructions uh, are, you can see as, as a, uh, a curve that is developing. It takes a little bit of time for your mind to actually get into gear when I say concentrate. You can't do that instantaneously. It takes a few seconds. So this orange curve, so what we're modeling here as to what would happen in the system in terms of the entanglement strength, if indeed you are able to mentally influence it. So we have periods of concentration and then periods of relaxation. You have this, this curve that's beginning to develop with a little bit of lag because it takes your mind time to switch. Uh, then there's a period we call get ready, which is uh, three to five seconds, which tells you to stop relaxing, get ready to concentrate and then another concentrate condition. And you just repeat this again and again. In a single session, you might do this 20 to 40 times, concentrate and relax, each time roughly 30 seconds. And so the model that we would expect if you're really modulating entanglement strength, it would look something like this curve. You would find a curve in the overall entanglement strength that looks like this. And in fact, this is what we got. So the fit, the data itself, or this is a jagged black curve. And the model that we fit to it is this orange curve. And it's almost exactly what you would expect if you are in fact mentally manipulating the entanglement strength of a system, which is actually in our case in another room. So we did experiments at ions. We did experiments with a colleague in France. These are the probabilities, overall probability corresponding to that curve that I showed, uh, quite significant. So it's at least less than 0.0002 probability, meaning, yeah, it's a very good fit. Our colleagues in France did not get a significant result, uh, which among other things is actually good because they used the same methods. And the fact that they didn't end up with a significant result gives us some confidence that there wasn't a mistake either in the apparatus or the analysis. They just, their people weren't able to produce the same result as the ones we used at ions. Uh, fortunately, you add it all together, you still end up with a significant result for all data. We run the same system under control conditions where no one's doing any kind of observation and it's all completely a chance. So we have some degree of evidence suggesting that what the strange things that we see in quantum mechanics, we actually do see in experiments that are using quantum mechanical principles to see if we see effects there, and we do. So maybe the strangeness is not quite as coincidental as, as we may think. So it raises this question then, well, how does any of this stuff work? Which is in a sense more interesting to me now because I'm pretty well convinced that it does work. So when we, we're talking about how does it work, we have to think about in philosophical terms, what do we think reality is? So you're familiar with Descartes, Cartesian duality, which is dualism. And he came up with the idea that there's a physical world and there's a mental world they're completely separate, completely both fundamental. The problem with dualism is that we don't know how something that is so fundamentally different from each other can interact. This is why most scientists are not dualists. We're monists. We, we like to think of reality as one thing. So physicalism or materialism 
assumes that matter is primary over mind. So this is the physical world, the mental world emerges out of it. That's the prevailing idea within science today. And it works, it works really well. The whole of modern civilization is based on materialism, on this idea of the way that things work. So monism is the scientific worldview in a sense, uh, as you'll see, it's extremely difficult to explain why these psychic things work from a purely materialistic perspective. Because among other things, if mind emerges out of matter, that means that your awareness or consciousness is emerging out of the brain. Well, if consciousness is emerging out of the thing inside your head, how does that do anything out in the world? How can you be psychic? How can you influence the physical world? Well, you can't. That's the problem. So you have to look at other worldviews. So another worldview is the esoteric worldview, uh, known as idealism. And this is what the founders of quantum mechanics had been using. They didn't call it probably the esoteric worldview. They call themselves idealists, but it's the same thing. It says that mind is primary and the physical world emerges out of mind in some way. So that's what this symbol means. So if we now look at, uh, at various degrees of ways of thinking about what's going on as Goldilocks and the three bears, well, this is like Goldilocks and the three worldviews. From a purely physicalistic perspective, very difficult to understand these kinds of phenomena. Idealism, yes, I'm favoring at this moment neutral monism. Neutral monism says that the physical world and the mental world emerge out of something else, some other even more primordial uh, substance that we don't have a name for. But it means that the material world and the physical world or, or sorry, the, the mental world and physical world are both fundamental in their own way. They interact because of this common source. And so this neutral substance, whatever it happens to be, it causes mind, it causes matter. So one way of thinking of this is something like water. So water, as we know, can, through phase transitions, turn into two things which seem extremely different from each other, but they actually come out of the same source. So maybe we can think of mind and matter in that way, something very ephemeral and fluid versus something rather hard and, and uh, as, as completely different, at least in when you see it visibly or measure it than mind, something like that. The idea of the matter being, being uh, primary over mind gives rise to the idea in the neurosciences of neural correlates of consciousness. And these are true. I mean, you, you can now uh, use EEG and fMRI methods to tell some things about what people are thinking about simply by looking at the pattern of behavior in the brain. So this, there's a lot of evidence that that is so. On the other hand, there's also a lot of evidence that mind is primary over matter, that you can make things happen purely with your mind. So both of these are true at the same time. So here's why, from a materialistic perspective, why it's so difficult to understand this. Materialism assumes that everything starts with physics and somehow chemistry emerges and somehow biology emerges as higher order ways of thinking about uh, matter and energy. And then psychology and consciousness is somehow emerging out of all of this. So from this perspective, some philosophers say that we're like zombies. We start purely with non-living hunks of matter and energy, and we end up with the illusion that we are aware, that we have awareness. That's why the, the zombie, it looks like it's alive, but it's not, it's an illusion. So from this perspective, when you think about psychic phenomena of any type, it's denied as impossible. And you see this repeatedly among skeptics who publish articles saying that the, they're not gonna pay any attention to the evidence of these experiments because they are impossible, literally, and what they don't say is because they're working from this worldview. And it's not unreasonable to just, it's not reasonable to throw it away because it works too well. On the other hand, we know that these phenomena exist. So what's, what's missing? Well, what's missing is that in these discussions, the worldview itself is not often talked about. So it shouldn't be surprising within physics, at least, to think that there are actually multiple worldviews that, that we use. So classical physics is a kind of a worldview. It has certain assumptions about the way things work. Einstein developed relativity, which is a very different worldview. 
Now we're talking about space and time being relative, the bending of space, black holes, all kinds of things that you would never even guess would exist in classical physics. And in quantum physics, again, you're talking about things like non-locality, observer effects, which you don't see in classical physics or relativity. And yet all of these we know are true based on both the theoretical ideas and more importantly, the empirical uh, verifications that these are in fact true. So classical physics isn't wrong. We don't throw it away. We just know that it's a subset of relativity. And we know that all of those are subsets of quantum physics, although we still don't know how to connect quantum mechanics with relativity. Someday we probably will. So the, this is what we currently think of as physical world. There's a huge amount that we don't know yet. Future, uh, other things that people are looking at, like we don't really know what dark energy and matter are. And all of this is sitting on philosophical ideas about what do we think reality is. So when we look at the esoteric worldview, we have to go all the way back to shamanism. And then we, we bring it up into uh, maybe 6,000 years ago. We see the development of uh, ways of thinking about what used to be just shamanism, Hermeticism, Neoplatonism, the Kabbalah, alchemy, Gnosticism. And in the East, very similar ideas you find in yoga, the Vedas, Buddhism, and so on. These uh, have been subjected to various analyses and syntheses. And probably the best known one is from Aldous Huxley, who synthesized all of it and basically said that all of these different traditions assume that consciousness is fundamental, more fundamental than the physical world. And so going back to this, this kind of design, we're not changing anything we know about physics through psychology, but we are changing where we think consciousness comes from. So it just basically is doing that. This, in this case, psychic phenomena, mind matter interaction, all of the esoteric traditions like magic, these are perfectly acceptable. And it's rather easy to understand because all of these phenomena that we're talking about, which are very strange, to consider from a materialistic perspective are almost obvious when you start seeing that actually they're all related to consciousness and that is primary over the rest of the physical world. And in addition, you don't change this. You now see materialism as a subset of a more comprehensive understanding of reality, which is actually idealism. So you don't throw away any of these textbooks. This, by the way, is one of the fears I hear expressed a lot that what you're talking about can't possibly be true because we'd have to throw away all our books on physics and start over again. Well, no, you don't. You just have to think more carefully about what the assumptions are within each of these domains and what we know theoretically and empirically remain pretty much the same, one new assumption. So when you look at, at other approaches here, one that I did with, uh, with Stuart Kaufman, who's a very well-known complexity theorist, and this is a picture of him at the Santa Fe Institute, uh, is the brain-mind system, is it a quantum system? And we came up with something we call a non-substance dualism, where there are ontologically real actuals and ontologically real possibles. And what that means is that within this kind of idea, actuals mean ontologically real means this is a real thing. This is simply the nature of reality itself. There's something called actuals, which is the world that we measure. But there's also ontologically real possibles. And this is one of the strange things about quantum mechanics, that the description that quantum mechanics gives of the, of the world is about potentials. It's about the, the possibilities of things, not the actuality. So in this model, we're saying there's something about measurement, including consciousness, that converts the possibles into the actuals. So one way to explain, again, is through Schrodinger's cat. You're all familiar with the idea that if you put a cat in a box and you have some kind of quantum event, like a radioactive particle, it could, it would, if it uh, decays within a certain amount of time, it would cause a hammer to break uh, a vial of poison and it would kill the cat. In the modern day, we say, no, this is an anesthetic and we put the cat to sleep, but it wouldn't kill it. Uh, or if the, the particle is not emitted within a certain amount of time, then the hammer won't drop and the cat remains awake. So Schrodinger's cat, Schrodinger proposed this idea, is both alive and dead at the same time. From a quantum, quantum, quantum mechanical perspective, these are possibilities, they are both true at the same time. So it's called words like superposition states, mixed states, all of it is true at the same time. 
Well, this creates a paradox from the point of view of the everyday reality. It can't be alive and dead or alive and asleep at the same time. It's a paradox to even suggest that such a thing is true, which is why quantum mechanics is considered quite strange. But what if you look at it this way? Schrodinger's cat is possibly dead and possibly alive, or possibly asleep and possibly awake. This has no paradox to it. So in the world of actuals, the world that we measure, our everyday world, yeah, we can talk about uh, the, 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 the cat is either dead or alive. That's all it can be. Otherwise, there's a paradox. In the world of possibilities, there's all kinds of things that could happen, and there's no paradox. So how do we transition from one to the other? How do we get from possible states, which are the states described by quantum mechanics, into the states that we actually measure? Well, John von Neumann, one of the, uh, the founders of quantum mechanics and pretty much set it in mathematical terms the way that it's used today. It's considered a super genius by the founders of quantum mechanics. He suggested that the way that this happens is through consciousness. That in the act of measuring something, we know it in some kind of non-physical form, and that then gives rise to the actual states. So there's something unusual that von Neumann and many others had proposed that somehow consciousness is involved in the process through which the possible world turns into the actual world. So are there similarities between quantum mechanics and, and psychic phenomena? I think so. How does it work? Well, it's either pure uh, materialism or it, that is not gonna work. It's, so it's either idealism or neutral monism, or maybe the brain is quantum. And in either case, all of those would somehow suggest that something about consciousness is extremely important in the way that the, the world works. So does mind interact with matter? Yes. Uh, are there, is this a coincidence about psychic phenomena and quantum mechanics? I would say probably not a coincidence. And in terms of how does it work? Well, as I said, it's somewhere between idealism, neutral monism or something else, but materialism alone is not gonna do the job. So I need to acknowledge uh, many people who have funded uh, this kind of work. Uh, Emerald Gate Charitable Trust, the Be All Foundation, the John B. Hutchinson Foundation, the Hitman Family Foundation, and then Jeff Parrott, Dick and Connie Adams, and uh, Patrick Devarin uh, have all contributed funding for these kinds of experiments and, and preparation of these talks and that sort of thing. And so at that point, I will stop and I thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>